Hola amigos, ¿cómo están ustedes? How are you today? This is for you in English, the confessional of Café with Cristina. The confessional is where you sit down with me and confess all your sins. Oh, no, no, no. It would take too long. Yeah, I only have <laughs> Hey guys, this is the end of the, the Hispanics as professionals in the United States of America. It's not only about like we had these weeks of having a business, creating a business, being an employee, you know, being a teacher, being an academic. It's also a profession, right? And there are Hispanics that are professionals. So I decided to write a living encyclopedia to end our journey of professionals in the U.S. By from next week, we'll have the Hispanic cultures, different Hispanic cultures, you know, starting uh, with Colombia, España, representing different areas in, in, in the world where we speak Spanish. ¿Qué te parece? Muy bien. Muy bien, muy bien, muy bien, muy bien. Okay, we call you living encyclopedia for something. How did you become one? Is it something that comes uh, in the family, in the family, like doctors, in the family, lawyers, or is that something specific? Well, I think it I is true have. that with many people, they want to imitate their parent and they understand what their parents are doing. The parents seem to like it, so they imitate that. And that's certainly the case with my son because I'm a professor, my wife's a professor. And he became, and he was always And he decided he's got his doctorate and he's doing great. And all, all, every, all of you in, in kind of, some kind of religious studies. That's right. Wow. They would say, Dr. Stevens, you got three of us there. <laughs> but for myself, I'm the first person in my family to get a doctorate. And I'm the first person to go into education. Wow. How but, did that happen? Well, I, it's because I was able to go to school and I got a scholarship. And um, Were I, you always that kind of nerd in school? I wouldn't call myself a nerd, but I was pretty smart. <laughs> I uh, the story, I don't shy about it. Well, no, no, well, no, but, but this is, I mean, you want to know. So the story was I was five years old and I started to read. And in those days, you couldn't go to school unless you were six when you started. Now, my birthday was in July. So I would have been in school for a whole year before I turned six. And they would wink if somebody was like in December, if you were six in December, you'd be like, so my mother, who was very pious and went to the Catholic school, the Catholic teacher, and said to the principal, can my son start school? And you were five. And I was five. And she said, well, we'll have to see if he can keep up with the others. So we started in September. In October, my mother went to the teacher. Mother Rita Josephine was her name. She said, how's my son doing? And she looked at her and she said, He's the smartest one in the class. Wow. So I, I, I loved learning. I love to read. I love to understand things. And How do you uh, make somebody love studying? Can well, you do that? Um, your mind is like a sponge. And I had this desire to learn. I had the example of my grandfather who, he was a, uh, he had been in the Navy. He had been a, a musician, but he wound up getting a degree in Pierce School of Business in Philadelphia. He had five children, six children around him, and he graduated summa cum laude. So it comes and, to that family. Yeah, and so he became the translator uh, for Spanish, French, and Italian, and Portuguese wow. for Sharp and Dome in Philadelphia, which at that time was the largest pharmaceutical firm in the U.S. of A. So he was the type of person who would always give me a word to learn and things like that. So... But That's you have siblings. Happened. Did that happen to your siblings? No. No. One became a dentist, the other became a chemical engineer, which were great professions. But um, education was very appealing to me. And there's something that I learned about our community in general when I started to teach at Brooklyn College. Where Bro were you teaching? Well, Brooklyn College is a city university, a branch of the city university, and has a very strong program for preparing teachers for the New York City school system. And so I was in the Puerto Rican Studies Department, and because bilingual education was a very important field for a growing number of people in New York, they uh, who were in charge of the School of Education... What, what year are we talking about? The 50s? Um, 60s? No. No. Would 70s? It, it would be the 70s. That's mm -hmm. right, the 70s. So they asked the Puerto Rican Studies Department, of which I was a member, can you prepare courses on culture? 
so that the students, the teachers, the future teachers who are going to have students from the Hispanic background will know what to expect and know how to understand and know how to deal with things. For instance, something very simple. Many of our people, our young people, are told to use the word usted and not the word tu when you speak in Spanish to someone in authority and not to look a person in the eyes. But you know, in Spanish, in Spain, you can say tu. It's not, uh, you know, well, well, I'm, I'm that was about about weird. So our people, the uh, students would not look at the teacher. They keep their head down so not to look at them. But in the culture of the U.S., this was seen as something that was negative, like trying to hide something. Another woman, she went on to become uh, a deputy mayor of New York. Her name was Martha Valle. She said in her first day in high school, they went around the room, how many people in your family? How many people in your family? So one said four, another said seven, another said three, another said two. They got to her and she says 72. And the teacher says, what? You can't have 72 people in the family. But she was counting el abuelo, el tío, el sobrino, el nieto. So those are things that are very important. And we discovered that the first profession that our Puerto Rican and other Latino uh, students wanted when they came to Brooklyn College was to be a teacher. Why do you think is that? Because that was the only professional person they had met. They had gone to school and the only person who was who, who they, they could identify with is doing something after graduation that they the wanted teacher. was the teacher. The teacher and then the social worker. And what about you? Because well, you became it, an academic too. Yeah, Who well, well, well it was a whole other story. I was kind of like off the off the beaten track there. I had a career in many other things in music and television and so forth. So for me, it was a fallback position. But the learning was always there. But in terms of our people, and I'm speaking in general, those were the careers that were very appealing. And we even reached a point where something like 85% of the students going to college were in education. Well, that's good, but it's not necessarily the best. So we said to our students, look, there are other opportunities. There are other employment. professions, right? The, yeah, there's other professions. So what happened before I got finished at Puerto Rican Studies at Brooklyn College? We developed a minor for people in radio and television. Because we had an excellent radio and television prepar preparation with theater and studios and resources. So we prepared students to, to do the Spanish language TV. And we had students coming from Venezuela, Colombia, wow. Dominican Republic to, to learn, learn there. That, because it was cheaper uh, than going to no, really? NYU. Of course, it was a public yeah, university. But more expensive than studying in their countries. But of course, the well, no, but they didn't have the technology and they didn't yeah. have the uh, up-to-date thing. The other thing we did was uh, commerce and, and personnel treatment. We found out that big stores like Macy's and uh, the Prudential Insurance and so forth, they were looking for people who understood Spanish language, who understood Spanish culture. So even something like a person who's overspent their credit card, that voice, the first contact you make, they may not pay you at all. And we were giving our students the, the equipment to be able to deal with that. And they had these fantastic jobs in some of the best stores and the best commercial parts of, of New York. So that the education profession, which was the basis for the reasons I said before, became a trampoline to do other things as well. And, and, and how do you see these people today? Are they still looking for jobs in education, social worker? Or are they expanding, especially the Hispanics? Well, I think they were expanding. Right? And one of the issues that we faced was that many of these companies would actually come to our department saying, we're having a job fair. We're looking for people. Can you send someone? And they wanted to hire the people because they knew Spanish. Maybe they didn't know it as fluently as someone at the United Nations during translation, but they had the culture in the language of two cultures and two... It's important to know the culture in any, any so, kind of right. business. But where do you think are the Hispanics heading now? Where is more demand in professionals uh, in the Hispanic, you know, in Hispanics here in the USA? Well, the, the need for learning culture and language is most directly felt in terms of relationships. That is to say, jobs that encounter one person with another, right? So... Um, hospitals, hospital personnel, the company's personnel, telecommunications, advertising, 
sales, marketing, right? And, you know, marketing, right. And the, the Spanish market is becoming so large and so diverse so that, for instance, there are certain words that you don't use with Cubans when you're speaking to Cubans that have a double, because they have a double know, meaning that double enables meaning. But somebody else would have the same thing. So uh, we've, we've created a sensitivity. And actually what we did when I was around was we started getting our Puerto Rican students to understand Dominican culture, Mexican culture, and we actually had the first conference of Chicano studies on the West Coast, University of Texas, with uh, Mexican American <coughs> studies, and then Puerto Rican studies in New York. And we had this uh, looking at Latino studies in the future. And uh, I mean, it was a natural thing to do, but it was something that was very important because that's the direction of everything now. You take a look at the media, uh, a, a show like Mi Familia, which is about a Mexican family in Los Angeles. So they had uh, Olmos, who's a, a Mexican guy, but then they had Jennifer Lopez, who's a Puerto Rican, and she's blending right in with the Mexicans. And Jimmy Smits, who actually went to Brooklyn College right before I was there, and he's from one of the islands, from um, uh, Curaçao or something, and then wound up in Puerto Rico. So here were these people who were Puerto Ricans, and they were merging with the Mexican-Americans and getting along. I often say that what's happening now with our communities is that being Puerto Rican or Dominican or Mexican or Colombian doesn't exist for most people because they've never been to those countries. What makes a Puerto Rican Puerto Rican is they live in Puerto Rico, they speak the language, mm -hmm. they have the inflections and vice versa. But we have this kind of Latinidad. So these people, you know, they eat tacos, they eat empanadas, you know, I mean, it's whatever, yeah, right? everything. and it's all like one big thing. So they're assimilating, not to the U.S. with some like, you know, Puritan, white, Norman Rockwell uh, culture. They're assimilating to this Latino culture that's vibrant, it's alive, salsa music, the best food, alive people. And you look at the advertisements. You won't see too many Brett girls with the blonde hair and the blue eyes. You'll see people of color because that's the future. That's the future. That's the future. But not only, oh, Hispanics are not only, you know, like dark or native. They're like a mix of, they can be Afro-American, they can look blonde, they can look everything, right? Anywhere. Well, that's true. But, but that's the image. But, but the look, the look is the, the, the you know, the moreno. Moreno. Moreno, so it's the, the dark hair, the brunette, the flashing yeah, eyes, the, the white teeth, the, vibrant, the olive, olive color, and those are things. And that's also Middle Eastern. It's also people. I mean, that's just great. So what are the biggest like, challenges and the biggest opportunities that you see in Hispanics in the professional world nowadays? Well, getting the education is You don't know everything. No, Tell no, us. The, the education is the basic. And one of the difficulties is that the connections between schooling and jobs has to be strengthened. A lot of our young people start in school, they have a family, maybe it's not even their own family, but they're supporting their mother or their father or their brother. And so they cut short their education, they don't get the degree. And the other issue is that the private schools become prohibitive in cost. And they'll give a, a, a scholarship like, you know, to this person, the other person, but the distance between an education and an elite education is becoming greater as the society gets more and more diverse. So someone that goes to Harvard or to Yale or to Princeton can step off the day they graduate from the platform and, 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 go, and, and go work on Wall Street as the day trader and make a million dollars a year where somebody else has made less. And what are the opportunities that you see for Hispanics? And we should embrace, embrace the opportunity well, I, I, because he's a living encyclopedia. Well, I think education is key, but I also believe that there's an awful lot to do in terms of uh, communications and, and um, commerce. Uh, not so much economics in the, in the abstract sense, but in sales and so forth. And I think people with intelligence and preparation can excel in those fields. So that's, that's a good place to launch the next generation. The next generation, right? And tell us, you didn't tell us before, how did you become a living encyclopedia? How, how did so much knowledge impact your life? Because sometimes they say that the ignorance is the key of happiness. What do you well, think about that? When you know too much, it's like, wow. Well, one simple thing is that when I joined the Puerto Rican Studies Department, we were supposed to teach everything about Puerto Rico, not just history, not just language, not just sociology, not just politics, but all of it. And so to be a good professor, I had to know a little bit of this, 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 that. So now people think that I know everything, 
but I don't know everything. Well, so a little I'm, secret, I don't. But what happens is I have a, a knowledge and an understanding of how different things fit together. Okay, tell me a secret. How can I be a living encyclopedia uh, now, today, with my daily life, like everybody else? How can we do that? A little living encyclopedia. Linkages. See the connection between one thing and another. And so if you see, for instance, why do we like rice so much? So ask yourself why? Well, it tastes good, but the reason was because in Puerto Rico, the Spaniards used to fill the ship with rice when they came from the Philippines because that would keep the ship from tipping over. So they had plenty of rice that people decided there's no rice grown in Puerto Rico. Wow. It's all imported, but it's because of that. Living encyclopedia, we deserve a chin chin, a toast. Chin chin! For the Living Encyclopedia for the future of the Hispanics and everybody else in the United States of America. So that we come a little Living Encyclopedia every day. Salud, amor y pesetas! Ale! O oh, euros mejor! Wow, muchas gracias, amigo! <laughs> That's so good! Thank you for being with us today. Now we'll be a little Living Encyclopedia. A little bit more today. <laughs>